Over the past few years, the famous speedrun marathons hosted by Games Done Quick has seen a decent amount of critique. Lots of people only follow GDQ marathons as their main source of entertainment and information when it comes to speedrunning. So when the people's seemingly only source of entertainment in speedrunning loses its initial charm, they tend to stop caring. Not many realize that there could be other marathons out there, there's lots of individual speedrun communities making content for their speed games, and lots of individual Twitch streamers are doing attempts and creative stuff daily. But my main focus with this video is going to be ESA, and how it compares to GDQ. ESA is the European Speedrunner Assembly, and it's the second biggest speedrun event held around the summertime in Sweden. I believe ESA is currently standing tall and strong as the heart and soul of the speedrunning community. Before I go into why, I need to talk a bit about myself first, why I attend these events, and how the two compare. My screen name is The Rixer, and I've been speedrunning since the days Speedruns Live was getting popular around mid-2012. I have been watching Games Done Quick grow since AGDQ 2013, but didn't attend an event myself until AGDQ 2016, where I did a race of Jack 3. I then attended it again in 2018 with my two runs, Dog's Life and Ratchet and Clank. It's difficult for me to attend every single GDQ event since I'm from Denmark, and traveling to the stage every year or every half year is both pricey and lengthy. This is why I resorted to look into something a bit closer to me after being inspired to go to a meet purely by watching AGDQ 2013. Turns out ESA was a thing, which I ended up attending later in 2013. I had one of the greatest experiences of my life seeing my internet friends for the first time. As of making this video, I have attended six ESAs. This is every summer ESA since 2013, with no streak broken. I also happened to run at every event I attended, so I'd say I'm a decent advocate to be the one to encapsulate the atmosphere and feeling of what a great speedrun event is supposed to be. My reasoning for going into my personal story with ESA and GDQ so much is I see a lot of people give their take on what the state of speedrunning, GDQ, or ESA is without ever having attended a speedrun event at all. Everyone throwing punches like this have not experienced all the fun that goes on behind the stage at these events. Speedrun marathons are so much more than just the stream. And yes, I get that the main point with these marathons are the stream and the charity. But I can be certain with you that my favorite moments at speedrun events are never being in the crowd for someone's run. As hype as it may be, it's never the highlight or the defining moment that makes you say, oh, that's why I go to these events. Instead, people see what's on stream, criticize it, and talk about it publicly. That's fine, freedom of speech is healthy, but in this regard, it's almost as if people are criticizing the event purely based on what the stream looks like. It's like judging a book by its cover. That's why I figured as a longtime attendee and follower of both events, it's time to make a video discussing my experiences with both events, how they compare, what one does better than the other, and perhaps what needs to change in order to make speedrunning a more enjoyable experience for everyone. Professionalism is perhaps the biggest critique GDQ is getting from the media these days. What I mean is that earlier iterations of GDQ has a much more genuine and natural approach to the stage performance, room atmosphere, and language. Everyone was allowed to express and be themselves in a less corporate environment. As the years have gone on, runs are starting to feel less and less distinct from one another due to having to follow a strict guideline in which extensive swearing isn't allowed, certain jokes are prohibited, and overall just having to act a certain way. Not to mention the behavior and performance during your run will affect your future chance of getting into GDQ. You can read this yourself on the GDQ's rule page or when submitting a run for the marathon. This only further encourages overly corporate behavior in hopes to getting to play on the main stage in the future. Speaking from experience, this causes me and probably a lot of other runners to worry more about not saying something that'll break the guidelines instead of actually having fun with the run. The strict ruling you have to undergo to do a run is fine by me and in the end up to the marathon but could be a detrimental factor. If gone too far, this could lead to runs feeling identical and ultimately boring with little variety and interest. Lots of the chemistry I have with my friends are never fully expressed during my own runs or the runs I commentate, due to what I suppose you could call inappropriate behavior. And if it's my friend's run that's on the line, I'm obviously going to be as corporate as possible and appeal to the masses to not screw over my friend and dick over his chances of getting into the event again. Something about the runs these days just feel stiff. In regards to their choice, going down this route, I hate to say it, but I can't really blame them. GDQ made sure that everyone could tune in to watch by having more stiff runs. It essentially appealed to every age group. This is yet again stated on the rules page, as Games Done Quick is a family-friendly event both in person and on stream. The main reason is of course due to the charity. The more viewers the marathon gets, the more donations you generate for the charity. And while ultimately this is all with good intent, I feel like pulling the charity card is not an excuse to try and make your event better, and prioritize quality over quantity. 
ESA has always marketed themselves as more of a social event than something that would generate massive amounts of donations for the charity. The motto is sort of, if you want to donate to support a good cause and to see cool incentives being performed, feel free, but if you can't, that's cool too. Of course, ESA is tiny when compared to the size of GDQ when you strictly look at the numbers, but it still raises a good point. They managed to raise a solid amount of donations in comparison to their size while not being overly corporate. ESA 2018 raised $120,000 for Save the Children, and while not the $2 million GDQ raises, it feels as if most runs are different from one another and have a unique charm to them. This is particularly due to the diversity of cultures and countries surrounding the runners at ESA. Of course, both marathons have runs every once in a while that don't interest you, but it doesn't prevent you from coming back to check out another run later on. Funny enough, ESA is self-aware enough that people might view their main stream to be too professional, and have thus created the secondary ESA stream, where more obscure games and ideas are at show, with a more cozy, old-school type feel. So we'll teleport and it'll take us back to the beginning, we'll run over and save it. So we're gonna save the secretary, donated by you. I'm not sure if GDQ has ever thought about the idea of having two streams, but it could be an idea to generate more viewers and donations. It could certainly be a gamble, but I can tell it works quite well for ESA, which is why they've stuck with it. ESA also has a more loose rule set when it comes to being an attendee and runner. For example, God of War is a series with lots of violence, blood, and even nudity. I stopped submitting God of War 1 to Games Done Quick since another runner of the same series, Ragnall, who was trying to submit God of War 2 at the time, was personally told in an email that the game would never get in due to the game's mature content, specifically the nudity. God of War 2 was actually at AGDQ 2013, but as previously mentioned, back then it wasn't as family friendly as it is now. To this day, it's not stated anywhere in the rules section or even the submissions guide that the game is not allowed in their event. So if Ragnall had never emailed GDQ about this, we would have been practicing our asses off the whole time for a GDQ submission, and it would have gone to complete waste, because the rules for mature games are so vague. Turns out, the slight nudity in a game about Greek mythology is apparently the issue. Yeah, really. Actually, update, the AGDQ 2019 games list just got released today as of recording this voiceover, and God of War 2 actually made it into the event. Ragnall managed to find out that the Japanese version of God of War 2 censors out parts of the game that GDQ would otherwise reject it for. Maybe a bit silly to go down the route where we have to find alternate versions of our games to get them accepted, but in any case, big congrats to Rag. I'll definitely be on the couch. This doesn't mean that there aren't also other inconsistencies that occur at GDQ. Grand Theft Auto Vice City got into GDQ not too long ago, and so did Resident Evil 7, a game much more filled with gore than God of War. It would be nice to get an official list, or at least a statement on what the minimal requirements are to mature games. Now this is where I ask you, the individual, watching, what is worse? The main character of Resident Evil 7 getting a knife stuck in his throat, his hand cut off, and shooting a girl in the face? Or a scene where Kratos is sitting on the side of a bed, and there's some boobies. I found this statement by Cool Maddie, the organizer of AGDQ 2018, on his Reddit AMA. As much as possible, we separate the game from the event in representation. Runners, commentators, staff, and volunteers are seen as representing the charity. The game is not. Also, there's another reason IMO. I don't want GDQ to turn into a swearing fest. Some runners can pull it off with heavy swearing as their shtick, but when you hear it run for a week straight, it's not funny anymore. It's obnoxious and distracting to the event, IMO. Now, here's my issue with this statement. You accept games like Resident Evil 7, you claim that the games do not represent the charity, why in the world would you ban specific games from the marathon in the first place then? Saying that games do not represent the marathon or the charity is just trying to dodge a bullet. As for swearing, characters in the game and runner swearing honestly should be treated equal. I don't see why it isn't. There's just a lot of missing consistency over what is allowed and what isn't, and a lot of trying to dodge responsibility, which I don't like. At ESA, however, I was told a clear message. The staff told me as long as the game is within Twitch's term of service, I was allowed to play it just fine, be myself, and joke around. And I did! And guess what? Not a single comment complained or even mentioned the gore, nudity, or swearing. Could it be that people don't actually care about the gore or nudity? No, that can't be it. Did people complain about the gore and carcinogens Resi 7 run? No. In fact, just by reading the comments, it did well. My run also happened to do surprisingly well. The views are good for ESA standards, and the like to dislike ratio isn't too bad. So the majority of people clearly enjoyed it. This is only one of many instances where I can see Games Done Quick prevent itself growth from being too corporate. 
and I'm not saying please accept my run to get more growth. It's just think of all the thousands of runs that are submitted every event that get rejected for the game not meeting a hidden mature content rule, even though it could have benefited the marathon. Think of how big Grand Theft Auto is. Think of how big Dark Souls is. Both of these games are two of the most popular and most watched series at ESA. Are we really going down the route where we'll have to ban those as well for having strong language and blood? I mean, probably not, it's an over-exaggeration, but it's food for thought. Many people thoroughly enjoy series like GTA and Dark Souls and don't play the games because of the mature content, but because they are fun. And in this instance, marathons benefit from having things that are fun. If lots of people had fun playing it, it probably means lots of people will have fun watching it as well. Must be fucking oh, 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 oh. He dropped an F-bomb. Not allowed in my Christian server. The game plan at GDQ is pretty clear-cut when it comes to the game selection. They tend to pick games that sold well in America, games lots of people are nostalgic about, combined with leaning towards picking the most popular runners. If a game or runner has done well in the past, it's a bonus, and you'll most likely have a bigger chance of getting in. But let's start with the first thing I said. They tend to pick games that sold well in America. This is one of my biggest issues when looking at the schedule for every GDQ event. Too much Nintendo. If you look at the amount of hours that Nintendo games take up from the event, it's just insane. If an event like GDQ insists on appealing to everyone, I really don't understand why the variety in games is always so lacking. I will say it's not always bad. A few events I've seen schedules with enough variance for me to see that there's something for everyone. But I've seen countless viewers, runners, and attendees mention that there's too much Nintendo. Two great examples here are Zelda and Mega Man. I understand that both series are popular, but even I, as a big fan of Mega Man games, can see that there can be too much. The schedule for the upcoming three-day event GDQX has been released, and it has four Mega Man games. Four in a three-day event. If you look at the previous SGDQ 2018, there were seven Zelda games in the schedule. These runs weren't short either, in fact, they took up a large portion of the marathon. Combining total runtime, the seven Zelda games took up 14 hours, 1 minute, and 16 seconds of the marathon. If you compare this with every PlayStation game that made it into the schedule, it adds up to 9 hours, 54 minutes, and 47 seconds. This is PlayStation 1, 2, 3, and 4 all together as only 10 hours. It's a sad statistic to look at, but in the end, it's the reality of what we've come to. While you could argue that it's a good business move to pick the most popular games in North America, you could also argue that you are excluding other parts of the world that have communities with big interest for the missing games. In Latin America, certain games have had big impact on sales and interest in video games. This naturally falls along with the interest in speedrunning, and by looking at some leaderboards, you can clearly see a decent size of Central and South American speedrunners. Europe is also a massive hotspot for video games and speedrunning. PC and PlayStation speedrunning is pretty much just as big as Nintendo over here, so I don't see why the approach to picking more variety is so frowned upon. If you run a game that's not Nintendo, you best be sure that your run is not over an hour long, otherwise your chances of getting in are very slim. Unless your game has a large following, or you have a large following, it's, it's a good luck for me. In the Ratchet & Clank community, we specifically talk about submitting categories with the appropriate length in hopes of getting into GDQ. The longest run we've gotten in in the modern era of GDQ was Zem's All Gold Bolts run, which barely broke the one hour mark. With the new AGDQ 2019 schedule being out as well, there is no Ratchet to be seen. It's a struggle in a competitive environment where several hour-long Nintendo games get picked easily every event. When looking at ESA 2018's schedule, there's a bit more variety in the game selection with the big thing here being there's a lot more PC. PC gaming is a lot bigger in Europe than you would think, so it's not a surprise to see how many times the word pops up under the platform segment. The PC games are perhaps a bit overkill and follow a region bias as they are popular with Europeans. I'm surprised I have to say it, but I feel like there might be a slight lack of Nintendo games on this schedule. I do feel like it's still a bit better than GDQ in the balancing aspects. PlayStation is, in my opinion, perfectly balanced, which is a sight to see. You also have to consider that a lot of the games listed under PC for both events is simply the run being performed on PC due to the faster load times or more exclusive tricks. Some games were initially popular with a console release, but then was ported to PC, which runners took advantage of. To better the viewing experience, I think it's up to us runners and communities to pitch more ambitious submissions so the organizers can see that more variety is warranted. 
but what's more important is for organizers of these events to be more open to accepting more variety and understanding that there needs to be something for everyone, not just their own region. As for picking the most popular runners, I think it's mostly fair, with a few exceptions. If a popular runner submits to an event with a popular game, it's a good business move to take them over someone else. But if set popular runner has a worse time in a game than a less popular runner, the less popular but better runner always gets picked, both for GDQ and ESA. I'm happy this is something both events hold true to, because in the end it's about whoever is the best of the game, who can show off more impressive tricks and strategies in the speedrun. Besides, there's no stopping the popular runner from being on commentary for the run anyway, so it's essentially a win-win situation. The only time the popular runners could be hurting their community or speed game is if they aren't aware of their impact when submitting to a marathon. It's important as a popular person running a game in a community to discuss with the community who is submitting what, so that maybe they can sit back and let others in the community have a chance at getting their submission in. But I think the overall choice of runners picked is something I'd give both events pretty strong props for. Even with a few runs that are considered flops or not enjoyable, you still have to consider that these organizers have to pick over 100 games every event, and it's almost impossible that everything will go right. There's a few things I want to cover when you, the viewer, are viewing the marathon. Interaction, entertainment, production quality. Let's start with ESA first on the interaction aspect. Both events really only have two ways of interacting with the marathon in any way, and it's by one, donating to the event, and two, Twitch chat. Since the size of ESA is so small in comparison to GDQ, every donation comment gets read out, you know, if it's not considerably inappropriate. This might change in the future as ESA gets more popular, but as of right now, they don't get enough donations to where it floods the stream and ruins the experience. Even if they did get a lot more donations, they would probably switch to what GDQ is doing, which is picking the donations that are either the largest amount or the most appropriate to read out. This is kind of what GDQ has to do due to their size, Although honestly, we need to stop donating with anything in the GDQ donation generator to increase our odds of getting our common read out. Yeah, it's it's a thing. You should check it out. No, seriously, what the fuck is this? As for Twitch chat, this is a touchy area I was hoping not to go into, but I have to sort of talk about it. As many of you already know, a GDQ 2018 was the first GDQ to implement subscriber-only chat. Spamming and posting reactions in Twitch chat during GDQ has always been there, but now has a paywall behind it. Even if you decide to spam with your account that has a paid subscription, you can still get banned, which encourages corporate behavior and removes all toxicity from the chat room. So, what's my take? Well, I've always been very neutral on this topic, as I see reasons for and against adding the wall. When I finished my Ratchet & Clank run at HDQ 2018, I was asked about this a few times on my AMA. The reason why I should be for it is largely due to the fact that I don't want my friends rewatching the run with Twitch chat to get hurt. Yes, yeah, surprise surprise, many speedrunners don't have super thick skin when it comes to taking insults, and I don't want people to think less of themselves just because of Twitch chat. I would have personally been fine with or without sub-only chat during my runs. I would say I'm capable of taking the shitstorm from Twitch chat any day, but I worry not only for myself, but for anyone more fragile. And if this is part of GDQ's reasoning why, I totally understand it. The reasons why I should be against it is because I can clearly see that a lot of people find it amusing. I've never personally interacted much in Twitch chat, but I'm not blind. I can see the appeal. I understand why people want an outlet to say funny remarks. Besides, there have been some pretty good connections between GDQ and Twitch chat in the past, such as the GDQ monitor back in the day and the task blocks where Twitch chat was brought up on screen. So for some, it can be part of the event's spirit going away because of this paywall. Due to more corporate reasons, they decided to go sub-only mode. I respect the decision, and like I said, I'm pretty neutral on it. I don't see it as a good or a bad thing. And when looking at it from a business perspective, it has not affected the donation total in the slightest. ESA, however, is still small and controllable enough to have an open Twitch chat for people to chat in. ESA staff are aware that it's an important part of the experience and even gave Twitch chat a shout out during the closing speeches. I would like to thank everyone that helped us with chat. Of course, you've been good chat. Of course, there's moderation involved, but it's still to the point where you can have fun. As long as you're not hurting anyone's feelings at the end of the day, who really cares, right? With entertainment, I'm talking about the quality of runs, interviews, and intermissions. This ultimately comes down to a trade-off. For GDQ's sake, the only thing I can think of that hinders the experience for me personally is the corporateness, which I've already touched upon. Whether it be overly stock donation comments or the dry commentary from the runners, I can usually still be entertained by a run, but it's just not as fun as it used to be years back. The amount of games I want to watch are also going down significantly due to the oversaturation of Nintendo games that I've been talking about as well. The break screens where they show off prizes and talk about upcoming runs are honestly unwatchable for me. 
It feels heavily scripted and disingenuous to watch. This might be because I know a few of the people on the team to do the intermission section, and they do not act this way at all in person. I get that it's not the main selling point, and it's better than having nothing between games, but this could use some serious work in the future. For ESA, the problem to solve is not as easy. At its core, it's unfortunately the language barrier. ESA has runners from all around the globe, although mostly Europe, so it's clear that you'll have runners who don't have as fluent English. This can hinder the experience, but can also enhance it, in the sense that one runner might be drastically different culturally than the next runner. So seeing that juxtaposition can be a fascination some are looking for. ESA has been getting better with this over the years since more Americans are getting more interested in the event. ESA's intermission screens are also a bit lacking. It's kind of like GDQ, except it's a bit more natural with two people talking to each other about, you know, whatever comes up. It's not necessarily as awkward or uncomfortable to watch as GDQ, but more or less just a bit bland and boring. Being there on site, I can tell most intermission people don't have a clue about most of the runs on the schedule. Some have little to no background on speedrunning, and also not exactly everyone is fit for the role of filling the void until the next run. I do think this format has good potential in the future, but also maybe new ideas and innovations are at hand. Take Beyond the Summit for an example. It's an event where pro esports players are invited to a house, host a big tournament with a big prize pool. During the downtime, they have small skits that play with high production value. Since I watch the Smash Summit very closely every time, I can say these skits work out super great and is one of the highlights of the event for me. I think this wouldn't be such a bad idea to incorporate for any marathon, given a small video editing crew. It's funny looking back at SGDQ 2012 and AGDQ 2013, you see a massive improvement in quality and layout. I remember thinking that the AGDQ 2013 layout was the hottest shit on the planet. Looking back, it doesn't hold up that well, and it's actually crazy how much better both events look now. But there's still some things to be desired. I want to start out by talking about the game quality. ESA 2018 has been using some excellent technology in regards to how the game looks on screen. Utilizing RGB with the help of the OSAC's upscaling capabilities, and you have a very crisp look on your retro consoles with vibrant colors and sharp pixels. Despite clearly being on a smaller budget with less sponsors than GDQ, ESA's picture quality in comparison is far better than GDQ on both standard def, high def consoles, and PC. If GDQ wants to improve their picture quality, they might need to take a look at how it's done in Sweden. Here's a comparison between SGDQ 2018 and ESA 2018's picture quality. GDQ tends to also have technical flubs with odd cropping and timers starting and ending at the wrong time, although ESA is also guilty of the latter. Two, one, go. I wanted to hit the button, so Ricky let me hit the button. Okay, so there's a few, there's, unfortunately, God of War games are- One thing that gets on my nerves despite being a minor issue in anyone else's eyes is how close the camera is to the runners. Back in the earlier iterations, the camera was a lot closer to the couch. It was much easier to see what every runner looked like, this is important to me because I want to associate the name on screen with a face I learned to recognize and then hope to see in future events. It varies from event to event, but I personally prefer it a bit closer. When further away, it feels as if the runners aren't important anymore and that the crowd is the main event. I guess it's because they want to generate more hype, I guess. All in all, when looking at the layouts themselves, they are very slick. GDQ, for instance, has some very cool innovations with the timer. The squares in the back of the timer box that light up actually correlate to the timer itself, which is really cool. Overall, I like the neon and it suits the marathon pretty well. Looking at how the event's layouts used to be in the past, they have definitely stepped up their game a bit. Although the color scheme on the webcam could look a little bit less brown, I don't really have much to criticize here. ESA is in a similar boat with their cool looking matte blue and yellow Swedish style layout. It comes off very easy on the eyes, not distracting and has only seen improvement over the years. Nothing to complain about here. Oh man, where do I start with this one? Everything that happens outside of the stream room is just one hell of an experience. Just being anywhere where you can see your online friends who you might have never seen before is just incredible. The reason I go to these events is for this reason alone, to see my friends. Going into ESA 2013, I came in only knowing a few of my friends. I left knowing over half the people at the venue. We were all so close that coming back at ESA 2014 was like a family reunion. I feel like that experience is slowly being taken away from us. 
because of people only wanting to show up at these events if they get their game accepted or to meet their favorite streamer. Not going in with the intent of actually having a good time, meeting new people, seeing the city together, or generally doing things that aren't always speedrun related. Because ESA and GDQ staff both do a really good job of having places like the arcade, where you can socialize by playing games with your friends. Runners are all very good at coming up with new speedrun ideas for the social aspect, or to get someone into your speed game. I remember at ESA 2015, Naglaria and E-Dragon had a setup of F-Zero GX. If you managed to beat the stage, you could write your name and time on the piece of paper next to the stand, and you would get a free burger at the end of the event. Creative and simple things like this just make an event super unforgettable for me. Unfortunately, it's getting harder to meet new people at GDQ these days. I find that most of the time you'll find individual communities use hotel rooms at the venue to hang out instead of being out in the open. This means as a new attendee, you'll have issues meeting people you want to meet because they lock themselves in. I was actually really afraid ESA 2018 was going to be that way because it's the first time the venue was in a hotel. I'm happy it wasn't. People only really use the hotel rooms to sleep, shower, and whatnot. You can easily walk up to anyone playing a game and just start asking questions. You can easily sit down for a group event and just hang out. Just random things like, I love playing GeoGuessr with people I don't even know who are yet. I enjoy getting our arcade PB and Quick and Crash in front of people I just met 10 minutes ago. I like seeing old faces I know and love, coming up with new ideas, new meme games, seeing a big mall together, being at the White House, drifting around in cars, playing Mafia, seeing my friends drunk. It's all just one big experience that'll never be taken away from me. Some of these experiences have happened at GDQ and some have happened at ESA. I will say you are more or less required to have a car when being at AGDQ if you want to see anything around the area since stuff is pretty far apart. Pretty much every ESA besides the 2018 edition has struggled heavily with having interesting stuff around as well. Luckily 2018 was in the center of Malmö, Sweden, so there was a lot to see. I also hear SGDQ generally has more to offer when it comes to tourist attractions and city life than AGDQ. I've never attended one myself, so I'll take people's word for it. When people criticize the downfall of speedrunning with the events we currently have, never forget the grassroots. People have been going to these events for years, people have built so many friendships, and that's why they keep coming back. I hope that by you watching this video, whether you're a runner, dedicated speedrun watcher, marathon organizer, or just a casual video game enthusiast stopping by, you can see that I still care about both events and the community surrounding them. I will keep submitting games and I will keep doing commentary for as long as it's still my passion. I hope the criticism will better the community and get some discussion going. If there was a topic I chose to not talk about in this video, it's because I think it's irrelevant or does not correlate to our growth as a community. I also mean no harm to any runners or fans when talking about games that take up too big of a spot in marathons. I think it's important to be kind to each other because speedrunning is the only thing some people have left to burn for. Many people wait half or even a full year for their one week of true happiness to see their friends and to enjoy a truly amazing hobby, passion, career, Call it whatever you make of it. I hope after watching this video you will give ESA a shot. I've clearly been giving the marathon a lot of props for being innovative, pretty to look at, and entertaining. I certainly think ESA is the best speedrun marathon out there right now. It may be a biased answer to the title of the video, but nothing encapsulates everything that I've been talking about as well as the European speedrunner assembly. Links are in the description to ESA's media, so if you want to catch their upcoming events, ESA Movember, ESA Winter, and ESA Summer, they are there. There are other speedrun marathons out there as well that have been trying to grow their size and deserves a look as well. Calithon in America, ASM in Australia, and the online speedrun event Shots Fired, just to name a few. Speaking of Shots Fired, I did not make this video with the intent of firing blind shots at GDQ. I do it because I want to better the community and I want to talk about the things I feel like are done wrong at the moment. You have to understand, I want GDQ to do well. They have so much exposure to the public, they essentially have all the influence in the world on what speedrunning looks like to the public eye, so I just wanted to give my 10 cents on what I imagine it should look like to the public eye. I still think they do a lot of things right, but it would be an understatement to say that they are anywhere close to perfect in this current state. Thank you all very much for watching, for sitting through this long video, and for taking the time of your day to catch me talk about a topic 
I've been wanting to get out there for a while. I got some links on screen if you want to follow me on my social media. I would really appreciate it if you enjoyed the vid. It's been a long time in the making, guys, so thank you again. I will see you all next time.